You're serious about business, right? Then it's time to get serious about doing things differently. Work has changed. It can be here, there, anytime, anywhere. Online, on site, on the red eye. And that means getting serious about how we collaborate. Across oceans or soccer fields. It means getting serious about how we come together to create, ideate, and make the big plans without the long hours. How we get everyone in the same space and synced up without having to meet up. How security and privacy are a must-have, not an add-on. And how important work doesn't interrupt important moments. We need to think seriously about building community and equity. Because the people you want to hire, well, they already do. You need to look like the future, not the past. Serious businesses don't just need tools that work. They need tools that work better for everyone. The kind we believe in building to help billions every day. The last two years have shown us that Google Workspace has the resiliency and flexibility to allow us to be successful. So no matter what comes next, we believe that with the product, we can continue to deliver to our clients in a really effective and high quality way. We use Google Workspace inside and outside of everything we do. It makes it super simple to coordinate within documents and collaborate with our teams. Abyss took the decision to move to Google Workspace because security became increasingly important. Moving from an on-premise legacy solution to a cloud-based solution is allowing us to work in a more secured environment. Hello and welcome to this Economist Impact Insight Hour as part of the Innovation at Work event series. Our session today is on uh, making hybrid work human. This session is sponsored by Google Workspace, so uh, thank you to them for their support. About 18 months ago, many organizations around the world started to return to office, and many of them started to adopt hybrid work models. And 18 months later, as we are speaking today, hybrid work has stayed but it has raised some, uh, presented some real challenges for employees, managers, um, and uh, workplace relations, uh, driving companies continue to uh, search for durable and effective micro, uh, hybrid work models. So what, what can we learn from the past 18 months to create a sustainable, human-centric working future? How can organizations combine technology and culture change to create a hybrid first mindset and solutions? These are some of the questions we're going to cover in the next one hour. Um, my name is Yu Xin Lin. I'm a senior manager with the policy and insights team at Economist Impact. I will be moderating the, our discussion today. I'm very pleased to be joined by a distinguished panel here. First, from our sponsor, Michael Brenzo, chief evangelist at Google Workspace. Adrian Colson, Chief Operating Officer at Rakuten Americas. Next, Anita, Anita Woolley, Professor of Organizational Behavior and Theory, Associate Dean of Research at the Taper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University. Last but not least, Nadine Thompson, Chief Technology Officer at Groupen. So welcome to all of you, and thank you very much for joining me in this discussion today. So let's dive in. Um, to start, I'd like to, to hear from each of you about the current state of hybrid work. What does hybrid work look like for you these days? How is it compared with 18 months ago? And do you notice any interesting trends, uh, shifts, or patterns you would like to share? Um, you could talk about, you should feel free to talk about that in the context of your organization or based on your uh, research. 
or simply based on your personal experience and observation. Uh, great, so with that, I think, uh, Nadine, why do you get started? When it comes to hybrid working, uh, there's a hybrid means a couple of things in this in this context. It means where you work. So if you're working from the office or working from home, it means when you work. So if you're working core hours, flexible hours or, or, or something in between and how you work. So how you're managing tasks, how you're communicating. And that's sort of, I think, all changed for all of us over the last um, 18 months. Now, I work in uh, Group M. Uh, it's a, uh, the media investment organization, which is part of WPP. It's a global organization. Uh, so we've got the intricacies of trying to manage international uh, offices. And we've got a sort of a three two guidance, but it differs between operating company and it differs between markets on how that is implemented. Um, one of the things that I've seen over the last 18 months when it comes to trends is we think back into the early days when we first went uh, remote, fully remote. We had endless video calls. We had uncertainty. We had um, end of days, which were hard to, to manage. Those, the days just seemed to drag on and on. And I think we've moved over the last 18 months into a more comfortable rhythm now. So we've organized ourselves a bit more around hybrid. I think what we haven't changed is we're still in an office first mode rather than a remote first mode. And many organizations are finding that hybrid really hard to break. And what hasn't uh, quite happened over the last 18 months is we haven't settled into a pattern. So if I think about my weeks, none of them look the same. Um, each this week, I'm in the office two particular days or a day and a half, and I'm in different offices. Next week, I'm in three days. The week I've, I've, after, I'm in one. And that's hard to manage the different environments, different tech setups, different uh, routines around your day. And so that is something I think we still need to get more comfortable with. Um, I think there's been a real focus just thinking about trends, though, on well-being over the last 18 months. So I, that has been something that um, because we've really had to think about kind of how employees feel about hybrid working and how employees work within the organization and making them more effective and well-being has been a real focus over COVID that's been something that I think has been a trend for the last 18 months and a, a, a valid and, and valuable trend. Great wonderful thank you I think we will uh, we are going to touch on uh, a few points you just mentioned in the rest of the session like uh, well-being things and productivity innovation so uh, next Maybe uh, Adrian, do you want to go next? Sure. I think, you know, I think hybrid delivers different value to different people. And honestly, a hybrid means freedom to choose from a lot of people's perspective. So in the context of my company, um, I can I can kind of walk you through what it means for us right now. Um, since April, we have been operating under a hybrid work pilot program that we based around activities. So we have, um, like Nadine, employees all over the world, US, Canada, Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and we're made up of actually 12 different unique business units, each with their own leadership teams. So you can imagine that was pretty tough to come up with a unified approach, but the way we did it was to encourage employees to come to an agreement with their managers about the kinds of activities that they felt would most benefit from in-person collaboration. And of course, those vary from team to team. So under this program, we kept attendance totally voluntary. Some days, you know, some, some teams would do two days a week or three days a week, and some people actually just stuck with the 100% remote norm from the beginning of the pandemic. So we've been running that now for about eight months, um, gathering data and just really taking some time to see how that's working. And then uh, I guess in late summer, early fall, we made a decision to shift things and starting in, Jan in January, we're going to actually shift into a more permanent state where we're introducing a three day per week in office standard. So there will be two anchor days and a third that's left flexible for the employees and managers to choose amongst themselves. And you know, on top of that, we're giving also the option for people to go 100% remote. And right now we're still going through that process as people are applying for that in preparation for January. So that standard has also been accompanied with a whole bunch of new benefits. You know, to Nadine's point, and I know we'll talk about it later, the focus on well-being, I think, is definitely true for us, too. So we've we've not only introduced benefits for people to go along with this uh, new mandate, I guess, for lack of a better word, but also 
given a ton of lead time for people to sort of digest this news, to be able to make personal arrangements um, and to figure out how to kind of work this new approach into their lives. Wonderful. I found that really interesting. Um, what I found really interesting is how you actually came up with this uh, relatively permanent model. You actually did a pilot model first. And also right now you say you are in the process of collecting feedback and maybe we think make some tweaks or adjustment to the model. So this is all I, I, I'm hoping that we, we will come back to this uh, when we get to the point of uh, about how how to make a hybrid work human, including how do we make the decision and then how can we collect feedback, analyze feedback to make the uh, model better. So the next, uh, Michael. Sure. Yeah, I would say uh, hybrid was really uh, an interesting topic one and a half, two years ago when we started to talk about it. And uh, many companies were trying to create uh, setups. They were testing out a lot. Um, so I can say on the uh, from the Google side, we have defined our approach with a three slash two model. Means that uh, the majority of our employees are uh, three days uh, in the office, two days uh, working remote slash from home. Because we've seen that's something that uh, that was really one of the most wanted setups that our employees had, uh, and we've also seen it works quite well because uh, our employees enjoy being at the office, but also. When it comes to flexibility, which I think is a big subject here when we talk about hybrid, uh, this is something what uh, our employees really appreciate. And when we look into the trends overall in everything, what I see when I speak with customers, uh, with technology leaders, when I speak with uh, HR leaders on the customer side, it seems that hybrid work is really uh, the norm now. It's nothing special, nothing new any longer. It's really more about, um, let's say, flexibility when it comes to work location and uh, and working hours is uh, the main ask or the main thing that employees are looking for. Another thing that pops up when we look into these trends elements is uh, the individual preferences. So employees really want to have the the the, uh, the option to choose where they work, ideally on which days. Uh, also, if possible, depending on the countries where this is an option choosing what time of the day they start, which hours of the day. So it's really something that uh, people want more and more. And also when it comes to uh, to te technology, if we talk about hybrid, I think many companies have learned that in order to have a successful working uh, hybrid model, you need to equip uh, your employees with the uh, respective technology. You need to equip everybody that is on board with a notebook. It should be a standard that everybody has, Wi-Fi at home, yes, for sure, but you also need to think about how you can support people working uh, maybe more days from home. And there are, of course, uh, employees that are requesting and seeking for a 100% remote option. So we uh, offer this as an additional options, uh, option to employees that someone can request uh, to go fully remote if it works in his or her job uh, to do it really fully remote. This is something what I see is, is uh, replicated by many organizations that uh, you really have hybrid as the new standard norm, but also that you give employees, at least from for those where it is possible, a chance to go into a full remote setup. As many see, again, the word flexibility as a key driver and uh, a very big benefit also when it comes to well-being and enjoying the job uh, more than ever before. Great, thank you, Michael. And I think technology, the role of technology, and how could we uh, really maxi maximize and cap uh, 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 capital capitalize on the power of technology in making hybrid work is a big topic. And I hope that we are, uh, and I think we are going to cover that in our uh, discussion shortly. Great, and Anita. Yes, well, I think, you know, you've kind of heard uh, the gamut of approaches that different organizations are taking right now to hybrid. It, it can mean different things in different environments, whether it means most workers are sometimes in the office and sometimes at home, or some workers are in the office and some are, are remote. It's kind of uh, used in, in the whole spectrum, um, but certainly we hear a lot about these uh, work from home policies often that involve rotating numbers of days and, and so on, uh, which become more and more common. Um, I do think though, I'm, you know, there have been a variety of experiences with uh, all, all these various policies. There are some organizations that have really 
uh, leaned into the opportunities that uh, remote and hybrid work can introduce, uh, particularly those that are willing to even let go of the idea of people coming to the office a certain number of days per week. I think those organizations are finding that they can tap into some different uh, groups of, for for access to labor, different kinds of uh, workers that have skills who left the workforce before because of difficulties in, in maintaining uh, a job or living in an area where they had access to certain kinds of jobs. Well, uh, some of these organizations are finding they can get access to these employees uh, if they're willing to be flexible about their location and, and working arrangements. So uh, those organizations tend to also um, Definitely technology is important and having the right tools, but also the norms and, and processes to support that. So really, you know, rethinking how they do things, maybe finding ways to coordinate asynchronously rather than relying so much on, on live real time meetings um, and trying to find ways to, to make work uh, more efficient and effective for everybody. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting to hear each of you um, that how uh, hybrid work has stayed in uh, varied uh, models and uh, a format across uh, organizations and even across countries and all these uh, interesting trends, patterns, and maybe questions uh, that have come out of this uh, past 18 months that uh, executives really need to think about. Um, so for the next, I would like to uh, I would like us to spend a, a little bit time to talk about uh, challenges and opportunities. So um, I wonder from your perspective, uh, what are the biggest gaps, uh, silos or challenges in hybrid environments that are getting in the way of uh, productivity, innovation or employee uh, well-being? In particular, in particular, I wonder whether there's anything that strikes you as uh, something you didn't expect. Uh, at the beginning when the hybrid work just started. So who wants to go first? I'm, I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> um, oh, okay. I, think, I think we don't, you know, the, there's so, so many challenges and opportunities, but one thing that I think about a lot is I don't think we know yet what the impact of this kind of work will have on people when we look at it through a lens of diversity and equity and inclusion. So, you know, we know that people of color and other underrepresented groups have experienced fewer microaggressions working from home. There's lots of research on that, lots, of, lots to read about that. I think there are considerations for neurodiverse workers, considerations for women who may choose remote at a greater rate than men. I think that maybe was, maybe that shouldn't have been a surprise, but anyway, that, that has turned out to be a, a reality. Um, I think all these things obviously impact well-being to our various groups of, of employees, and it becomes extremely challenging for leadership to maintain an equitable experience for all employees. And I think what really worries me is that we end up using remote work as a crutch to further enable that sort of environment where we have true, still systemic inequity inside the in-person workplace, those microaggressions on the bias that, that exists there. Um, you know, I think we just need to be really careful and thoughtful. I think it presents a great opportunity for us as well to talk about these things in a really open way, maybe, maybe more openly than we've ever talked about it before. Um, and I think puts pressure on leadership to really be looking at uh, the data. So how are these underrepresented groups really really affected by the switch to 100% remote, if that's the case, or how are they affected by hybrid, looking at attrition data, looking at the data around promotions for groups, looking at career development, all of those things, and, and being able to share that data openly with the employee base and then course correct as necessary. That's setting the bar really high, but I think that's what we need to do. Wonderful. Just wanna pick up on Adrian's point there, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is I agree with her. I think there's a, a real opportunity here for gender progression, for people with physical disabilities who can't um, pretend to make, make their way into an office, and for people outside major cities become more involved uh, or to, to, to have career progression through the workforce. So it is going to require both data collection and structures put in place 
to ensure that it's an opportunity and they're not um, sort of suffering uh, further from, from the, the hybrid uh, workplace. But one thing I, I what sort of struck me as Adrian was speaking was, um, and something I've been thinking about recently, is that hybrid is actually a different experience for everyone. So we've all got different um different work life situations i mean some employees have a poor living situation um or really crave that uh, office interaction and so they do better in the office other employees find like switching between workplaces and technology setups and different um timetables and schedules to be really emotionally um draining so Hybrid is quite, um, I think to get it right, we actually almost need to customise the hybrid work experience by the individual. And that's quite an ask for an organisation, which is used to creating policies that basically say everyone is in the office and we, we work it all from there. And I think part of that um, sort of hybrid, so it's really creating that hybrid uh, experience by individual, but also thinking about moving away. I think businesses are still operating in a, um, office first uh, uh, mindset rather than a remote first mindset. And I think that really needs to switch. And we're trying to um, retrofit our old office processes and ways of working into, into hybrid working. And I think we need to reimagine the future of work rather than trying to retrofit those processes. Yeah, I agree. And also when I I look on the on another big topic that we that we've seen often and heard uh, is also collaboration equity. Which brings again the challenge up. How can we make sure that everybody that is working now from home, uh, is seen in the same, uh, uh, same way as everybody that might be in an office? So is it about representation equity so that everybody has access to still, uh, let's say being seen in the same way, heard in the same way, portrait equally such, uh, such points or other, uh, elements that we've learned are important as well is really, um, that, that there is also, uh, equality on uh, accessing information. As well as when we do these virtual calls and sessions all the, uh, and more and more than ever before, how can we make sure that there is no disadvantage that people connect in an office, sitting in an office room, let's say three, four people, and then you have six people joining virtually. So we have learned and adapted our technology a lot here. So, and we see that also, um, uh, closed caption translations are used more often because people, uh, feel more, uh, more, yeah, being included when we offer, uh, such functionalities as well as re, uh, really seeing it as a standard norm that everybody has the freedom to choose when they, uh, if they join remote or virtually. So we really uh, uh, had a big ask a while ago from, from our employees, how can we make it easier to see who will be in an office and who will be working from home? So such a simple thing for us, adding in our calendar uh, that you add, you can say, I joined virtually or in a meeting room, also brought a lot more, let's say, positive mood in meetings because Others could see, oh, cool, the other three people are also in the office today. So let's meet all together in one room instead of really having three people having calls in, in several different rooms, although they are in the same building. So such simple ideas and innovations in collaboration technology creates a much better way of collaboration equity and fairness. And we've seen that people enjoy working together in this new hybrid world much more uh, than, than before uh, we had such features. And of course, this is not the end. We still uh, finding new solutions and ideas that we could bring up to make it a much better environment uh, in this new hybrid world uh, of working. Yeah, and, and I was really uh, glad to hear that all of you sort of touch on this very important topic. I mean, I believe it's on the top of uh, our executive's minds today, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and maybe belonging by right? EDINP. And um, how what does what does hybrid work mean for um, uh, organizations, for executives to pursue their goals around this topic? Whether, to what extent it represents a challenge or to what extent it might be an opportunity. So Anita, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious to hear your view on that. Yeah, I, I actually think there are some real opportunities with hybrid work for uh, also pursuing some of the DEI and B uh, goals that so many organizations have now. Uh, first of all, when we go back to just, you know, what the, some of the advantage, advantages that we saw from hybrid work, maybe even some that we didn't expect initially, we do hear that some of these workers did 
uh, actually appreciate not going to the office, not being exposed to microaggressions and other uh, sorts of things that are daily reality uh, for many workers who are not, uh, you know, uh, who don't uh, fit in with the norm, whatever that might be in that environment. And so um, just building on that, I think we can also uh, start to, you know, really revisit the role of work and uh, versus uh, people's lives outside of the office in terms of their social support system. We did see that some people uh, were found that they could and were pleasantly surprised to be able to uh, have more of a, a balance and a division between those two parts of their life when they were working more remotely. And it could very well be that this might be beneficial, in fact, for DE. E, I, and B, because people won't have the, quite the same pressures either to create their primary friendships at work or to feel marginalized when that isn't the experience they're having at work, but it feels like that's what they're supposed to be doing based on norms in the workplace. And so um, I know that there are a lot of conversations right now about uh, whether or not remote or hybrid working is reducing uh, the extent to which workers are creating friendships at work. And I think that there's an important conversation to be had about how what role friendship should be playing in the workplace and how maybe we could foster a, a healthier balance for employees that might help a broader range of employees feel like they belong. Okay, wonderful. So as people say, challenges and opportunities over uh, often go hand in hand. And I think this is definitely mm -hmm. the case. Uh, in, in the context of this hybrid work. So um, next, I would like us to really to uh, focus on um, to focus our discussion about how like we 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 have uh, talked a lot a, a lot about what have happened, what challenges and opportunities we've seen, and then how and, and then the key question is really how how can we make um, make this work right make a hybrid work uh, human so that we're able to uh, retain and uh, reinforce this uh, human connection in a uh, hybrid setting and retain and strengthen um, organizations competitiveness and ability to uh, innovate and also to address these uh, emerging fault lines between different groups or different segments of, of employees uh, many of you uh, pointed out, earlier. So I think I would just start with a broad question and and then that uh, that you take it from here. So what lessons, what are the key lessons do you think uh, we can learn from the past 18 months? Like what worked and what didn't? I know some of you already touched on that a little bit earlier, but if you could, if you'd like to dive, uh, dive in, dig in a little bit more, please feel free. Um. So I'll I'll um, start. Uh, I guess one thing that um, is coming up a lot as again different organizations grapple with how to manage these uh, flexible work policies is uh, the organizations that are are experiencing these changes in a more uh, successful way are often also finding ways to focus more on employee contributions as the basis of evaluation rather than uh, work hours and location. Uh, and so often if an, if organizations are you know really sort of uh relying heavily on informal sense of people's commitment based on seeing them based on conversations with them uh that often works at odds uh with some of the flexible or remote work policies that they might be trying to implement and that can also lead to this dual class structure that has been mentioned earlier around people who are not in the office as much being at a disadvantage and so I think uh, the organizations that are finding um, better ways to to provide uh, feedback based on contribution are both seeing less of a bias against people who are not in the office, but also doing another important thing, which is giving workers feedback about the the outcomes of their work, the impact that they're having, um, and giving them a sense of how it fits into the broader whole of the organization and their contribution, which are important features that can also mitigate burnout, uh, which are you know are some of the other issues we've been hearing more and more about. So I think that um, those are important lessons to try to build on. Yeah, great. I, I, I think you have. Uh... 
you have outlined a lot here, and it's, it's hard to, to add uh, many additional points here. Um, I think also important it is when it comes to really make sure people understand that they are uh, they are not required to work 24/7 because the computer is online all the time. Uh, so we have learned and we, we ask employees really to make sure that they also uh, take care of, uh, let's say, having a break in the afternoon, taking really, putting blockers, so-called focus time, as we call it, into their calendars, where they really switch off for an hour to make sure that they have a break. Uh, and uh, especially when we collaborate across different time zones, we see that really uh, adding simple things like working hours. When are my times that I'm available to work and when can people reach out to me? This is something we've, we've learned has been really asked and appreciated by many employees so that you can easily define I'm available from, let's say, from nine to six to have calls uh, and not to be uh, asked all the time to have calls at late night. So simple features here uh, helped us really to overcome these challenges uh, in order to avoid things that you are mentioned, uh, Anita, to avoid burnout, that people feel they have to do calls at 2, 3 a.m. in the night. So we also come back here to how can technology help us to overcome these? And uh, this is also what we hear from our customers uh, and especially when HR uh, leaders are coming into the discussions that they often say, how can we make sure that people are not working uh, too much overtime uh, without having the pressure of others that sent them an invite for 10 p.m.? How do they know? So this is always coming down to the technology piece where we try to be more innovative, adding more and more features to make sure people see when I'm online, when, I, when can I work in order to avoid these late night works and then ending up with a 20 hour day and uh, oops, it's really, it was too long. So really making sure that everybody knows when you are available and when you can collaborate easier with colleagues without the need of feeling I need to be 24 seven Monday to Friday or even longer. That truly is, is something that helps a lot what, I, what we see internally and of course also see from our customers. And I'd say alongside those technology and policies that we're implementing in organizations, I think we need to really focus on developing managers to be better at managing teams and building culture remotely. I think that's where you get real success. If you can get consistent, focused effort on culture building, and it's harder remotely, it's definitely harder. It's a bit like running a global team. I think, um, which I, I've done through much of my career, and you have to put a real focus on communications, a real focus on building culture, a real focus on relationships and trust and team rituals and communications. And that actually is what enables it to be more human. And so I think we need to help develop managers, develop skills in those areas and understand the importance of, of that um, as part of their, their role. Yeah, I think that's so interesting about culture building. You're 100% right. I agree with you. I think, you know, I, I've been looking at things a lot from the leadership point of view. And one of the things that we have learned the hard way, I think, is that these decisions are really hard to make for leadership, right? And all of these decisions do accumulate into a culture building set of activities. And so, you know, they're hard lesson, but there's no single solution to any of these problems that is going to address everyone's unique circumstances, right? Like you were saying, Anita, like, I like that idea of bespoke solutions for everyone. I don't know how to deliver that, but, but, you know, but that's effectively what we're sort of trying to do is make these decisions as leaders that are the best thing that serve as many people as possible while conceding that there's no one solution that's going to, that, there's no way to make everyone happy. And I think for us coming to grips with that as a leadership team took some time. And, um, you know, we had to choose a stance in every situation that we could articulate, that we could clearly explain the reasons why. And, um, you know, making those decisions with humanity and empathy are, are uh, be, become building blocks of, of culture as you go through those hard, hard processes and hard decision making. You know, especially with what's going on in the news and in the in the world all around us, you know, people, employees will not tolerate dictates from leaders who tell them what to do without being provided a compelling reason to uh, to do it or to time to adjust. Um, it's just striking right now to watch what's you know people walking away um, from jobs when there's thousands of layoffs at peer companies all around them. You know, leadership actions speak so loudly. So. Those are some of the lessons that, that I think we're all learning. 
Yeah, and I think there are a couple of things I would like to dive in a little bit uh, just to build on uh, what you um, talk about. Uh, one is about management, manager, manager skills. And I think, um, I don't remember which one, but I think uh, one of two of you pointed out the importance of, uh, importance of equipping uh, managers with the right skill, right? And uh, actually last year, Economist Impact uh, conducted a global survey among um, knowledge workers, uh, which was sponsored by Google uh, uh, Workspace. And in that uh, survey, uh, it showed that uh, over 75% of respondents uh, pointed out that uh, uh, some improvement or uh, some improvement need to be done to uh, provide training, appropriate trainings to managers to make them equipped for uh, managing a hybrid uh, work setting. So I, I'm, I wonder whether uh, in your organizations or based on your experience, have you heard of any uh, interesting practices or uh, good practices that um, in which uh, managers are getting uh, uh, appropriate or useful training for uh, hybrid work? Or maybe if there, uh, if it's not about a like, good practice or uh, something that is uh, definitely we are definitely sure it's successful or effective, you can also talk about any challenges, um, barriers to providing uh, you're facing to providing uh, this kind of uh, training to managers. Yeah, you need to provide surely training to managers who might have never led the team in the earlier days before the pandemic, right? So many have had their teams in the office, they came there, they spoke with them regularly face to face. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, meaning more than two years now, <laughs> um, that they have to lead now the teams anyway uh, remotely. And it will stay. It's nothing that will turn back for many organizations. So I have seen uh, a lot of organizations around the world that really, uh, uh, invest a lot in train managers and leaders to make sure they continuing uh, continue to really work with their teams remote in the same way they have done it probably 10, 20 years before we had the hybrid topic or the remote. Um, it will also be a challenge for many that might have just been, let's say, have seen their people once in a while or every few weeks when they came into an office. And now maybe they have half of their team asking to go fully remote. So it will not be just some temporarily thing and they can meet with them regularly. So there is a need, I think, that organizations need to keep coaching the leaders uh, to make sure that they are ready for whatever change their team, their employees are requesting. If you have already had global teams before, it was, I think, a bit an easier way because you always had a bit of a remote interaction. But if you have been in a local organization where everybody was just on site and all of a sudden now you have half of your team asking for fully remote, I think there is an ongoing need for really uh, uh, coaching and learning so that it stays fair, as Anita outlined earlier, that really everybody uh, is really uh, not forgotten, no matter where they are, where they are uh, working from. And there are no such things like those people that go into the office uh, more often might have a higher chance for promotion. This should never come up. So it should really always be fair and equal to everybody. And so, yes, I agree. I think it's important to keep um, a, a, a dedicated level of regular coaching and trainings up for managers, no matter what uh, setups we will have in the future. If hybrid stays as it is, as we expect, or if remote becomes the new norm, who knows? Yeah, excellent point. Um, anyone else want to make a comment on that? Yeah, Anita. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, I well, I wanted to just build on uh, some of the points being made and, and maybe expand a bit. I think that there <clears throat> there certainly are trainings going on and often they start by focusing on technology. And as I mentioned earlier, I think there are also some um, habits and uh, other, you know, sort of more deep seated uh uh, practices that probably need to be revisited. I know that many leaders organize their day around meetings. Uh, in fact, you know, that's that's very much how they construe their their work. Their job is working with their um, employees, uh, whether it's in mentoring or coordinating or planning or, you know, whatever the functions are. It's always happened in live meetings and it's happened as much as possible in person. 
Uh, and their sense of what people are contributing is also very much shaped uh, by those interactions, right? And so it's a fairly large change to go from thinking of your role in that way to thinking of it as maybe more asynchronous work practices where things are being reviewed uh, in documents or online. Uh, maybe, you know, cl real-time collaboration is, is uh, reserved for many, many fewer uh, kinds of activities. Um, but then how do you have a sense of how people are doing, what they need, how you can help them? Will you have to have, you know, practices that you design for that? And it's very uh, much a shift in mindset around how, what you're role is and how you work with people that is not easy to make, um, along with some of the other things we've discussed around changing how people are evaluated and um, and, and how you support them um, when you're remote. So um, I, I think that it, that's hard to just do in a training. Wonderful. And I think... Um, Someone, I, just yeah. wanted, I just wanted to build on what Anita was saying. I think one thing we've noticed is that uh, you mentioned that evolution of manager training starting around technology and then sort of uh, maturing from there. And we've seen that too and noticed a real, um, a real kind of potential weak point around communication. So mm -hmm. as decisions are made around policies up top, you know, at the C-suite level, if if and when we have um, we have not adequately trained the middle management layer on why we made the decision, what the decision was, whether that was related to which technology we're going to use and how we're going to use it, how we're going to conduct meetings, how you know, going forward, how we're going to handle changes in performance management, whatever it is. I mean, there's so many things. Skipping over that management layer was uh, was problematic in the beginning. We found our way. But there really is a step in there where that, that layer of folks needs to stop and understand why the decisions are being made, really digest and internalize for themselves what's going on so that they can then impart that and kind of cascade that down, down the layers through all of the individual contributors. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, um, an important additional step in that, in that kind of um, evolution of management training and just really being aware of what's going on in their worlds and the huge shift that this really is for them. Yeah. Um, and I think Adrian pointed out to a very important um, uh, topic of uh, communications. Also, I think Anita and Michael also um, sort of uh, commented on that. I think communication is always uh, important. I think clear communication active communication and even inclusive communication, I think is key uh, these days in a hybrid work setting at, at different levels, right? From executives to middle manager, from middle managers to employees. So um, how can we, how could we make that happen? How could we ensure a, uh, a, a communication happen as we, we desire, as an active, as a inclusive, as a, um, as a clear, what do you think are key uh, key elements or key lessons we've learned from this process? Um, well, uh, I would uh, build on what uh, Nadine was saying earlier about remote first work work practices, um, which often involve a lot more asynchronous work practices. And the reason why I connect that to inclusive um, communication is because uh, when you say for instance, mix uh, a discussion uh, with, you know, contributions that can happen asynchronously online using various communication tools, you can more easily incorporate <clears throat> a whole wide variety of inputs that are not limited to those who could be present at the meeting in person whenever it happened. Um, and also giving opportunity for people who maybe need a little time to process and and make their contribution and may not get their uh you know perspective in in the middle of a discussion with lots of people uh, etc and so i know in education we have uh found that using uh, a mix of online discussions um can be really helpful for lots of students and not just relying on real time discussions um and as well as uh you know recording and communicating um, action items and, and collaborating and 
doing handoffs, also asynchronously using various digital tools can also facilitate everybody uh, understanding what is expected, making it clear uh, what they've contributed and being part of uh, the coordination process. I got someone else wanted to... Was it Nadine, was it you? Sure, no, I was just gonna comment on, on what Anita was saying, just on, on communications. I think um, one of the things that we really need to develop the skill of within employees is great written communication because we now rely more on written communication. It's obviously also video calls, but things are, because we're working at different times, that is a skill that we really need to focus on it and develop and something that we're working on um, within Group M. Um, but also I think we need to think about uh, for managers, the tone of the communications and really setting, uh, understanding that communication is an incredibly critical part of a management role. Um, I mean, Adrian was um, mentioning how that became sort of the key success factor in making sure policies are understood through the organisation. But managing putting consistent effort and time into communication is actually what really um, makes a difference to to how teams work, how culture is built. Yeah, agree. Yeah. So I think it's also important to make sure there is uh, in these hybrid setups a kind of a special meeting culture defined, because we need to make sure that everybody is included in the communications and discussions. If you have a one-hour meeting, how do you monitor, how do you make sure that the leader of the meeting is not just doing, let's say, one-way communication. Because in the earlier days, when we might have been in the office all together, it was easier to stand up, to raise the hand physically to be in there. So I think it's important also that companies establish really uh, a culture how to run meetings so that it's really a common practice to use the ha something like a hand raise feature because I have a question. I want to be seen. I want to have the chance to speak up now. Uh, as well as when we, when we look into... Um, other possibilities that, uh, let's say, polls are used in these questions, breakout rooms, all these simple things that we know from virtual events. This is now the standard for having meetings and interactions with our employees and colleagues. This should be the norm and the standard and not just an event feature. So we are using this more and more internally to make sure that even when a group is doing, a, let's say, a project group discussion, that they have a, a breakout room uh, or that we really collaborate online in real time in documents, which was some years ago, not the norm. Now it is uh, is a good thing that I can say, hey, I can work in a document while do it. We don't have to chase others for sending us attachments like years ago. Collaborating in real time makes it like sitting in the good old days in front of one computer and three people next to me. It's the same thing, but in a in, in a in a in a new in the new world. This is really something that I really uh, enjoy seeing when people really collaborate, even if it's 50 people in one document working around. It seems like it feels now more and more that people are in the room, collaborating, intensified collaboration. This, I think, defines the new ways uh, of, of collaboration uh, and establishing also, if you use it correctly, a new way of a new, new culture, how we interact with all our employees and colleagues. Uh, and this is something we are proud of, that this is established in our organization. And we see that this also increased in the happiness because everybody can contribute even with a simple hand raise function, but also with the option really to work together seamlessly, which must be the standard from my point of view, and not just an option for employees, no matter who you are in the organization and where you sit. Um, I do want to pull back a little bit and uh, have us to have some discussion about uh, decision making. How do we make decisions uh, create policies around hybrid work. And I also would love to hear a bit more about uh, later on, um, how do we collect feedback from uh, employees? What, what do we do with those feedback? And with that, could we, uh, how do we use those to continue to, uh, to, to, to adapt or uh, improve the hybrid work policies? So uh, Adrian, since you talk about this very impressive pilot project uh, that happens at your, in your organization, maybe I will start with you. Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, the biggest thing I've tried to avoid is getting out in front of the pandemic's progress and being forced into decisions and policy reversals and switches and so on that, you know, you've, I've seen, we've seen so many companies go back and forth. I think sometimes it's made us seem slower to respond and slower to take action and make decisions. But 
I do think it's helped us achieve a bigger goal of providing calm and consistency. And, you know, again, back to the importance of that tone of voice, like that communications piece, I think I can't overstate the importance of it. It has helped create just the glue that has glued everything together and, uh, and, and provide foundation and, um, and a real soft landing place for the decisions as we have made them. I think, you know, I hope, and I think that the approach we've taken with decision-making has had the impact for people that have been with us through the whole time. Hopefully they have a sense that with each change, we've been logical. Um, you know, it has, each change has logically followed the previous one. We have not overreacted to either good news or bad news and kept kind of in progress with the pandemic. And, and communication around that is, is a big piece of the success there, I think. Want to jump in? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, in terms of the decision making and really managing the change effectively, it's it's critical, whatever the approach is going to be around, especially, you know, first there's the policy, but then there are the work practices to support it, that those work practices are modeled and adopted uh thoroughly by from the highest levels of the organization. I've been part of several projects where, you know, there's there's been a an effort to introduce some tools that might help make work practices more effective. But as soon as a manager is feeling nervous about something, they throw it aside and they go back to the old way of doing things, you know, where they kind of want to haul everybody in, you know, in person, or they at least want to get on a video conference and, and forget about some of the other practices that they were trying to implement. And so I think that, you know, just acknowledging that letting go of some of these old practices can be hard. Some of the new practices can be very effective. It's going to take a little time before everybody gets used to it, but to stick with it, right? Uh, because I think that some of the organizations that have concluded that these uh, new policies can't work are the ones who maybe have not fully uh, embraced some of the other changes that would support making these work very well. I think it's just going to take time. We've been, I mean, we've been an office organization. We've all been office organizations for decades. So we're moving into a very different work, uh, work practice, a work life practice. And it's really, it's changing not only where we work, but it's changing, it's changing the world of work. It's, we're, you know, we're looking at, um, hours and kind of, is there core hours or flexible hours? So people are working different hours than, than kind of potentially a nine to five thirty office day of old. And, the type of, you know, what we value out of work. Like I think, um, I come from Anita Adrian. We're making the comment about sort of a meeting centric culture. We're kind of, we're changing what's important and how we output, um, in work. So I think it's going to take, I mean, the last two, two and a half years have been a bit of a roller coaster where we've kind of, you know, the very early days where things were just, um, you know, I found that, that initial remote uh, transition to remote so difficult um, amongst, of course, an environment of lots of uncertainty. And now we're kind of transitioning out of that remote to sort of hybrid and the world is changing and it will change again. I think we haven't yet got to the um, the end goal. Things are going to evolve and change as we go forward. Yeah, I agree. So it, it's also from my view, I think that, that we are not yet probably at the end goal. Uh, I hear from many organizations, they're still trying to shape those hybrid standards and define a culture, define policies and processes. Um, we have had the advantage that we already had uh, a, a collaboration platform available and everybody has a notebook in the organization. So that this was probably a bit easier for us to move into these tougher times during the pandemic. And people had to work from home from one day to the other. But also now with the new setup, uh, it's we try to understand and we want to hear what our employees want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable with it. Yeah? And so uh, I think when I, there is not really a, a standard. The more I speak with, uh, with with customers around the world, it's many try to see what we are doing, uh, replicating ideas and solutions. But it's, uh, yeah, there is, as you say, Nadine, probably uh there is maybe another version of model coming in the future, but I would say definitely hybrid will be a, a staying model and an option because people can choose how and where and when they work uh, and policies will adapt over time, depending on countries, jobs and, and levels. 
uh, uh, no matter where you are based or what job you do. And so um, I would still say the hybrid, hybrid work stays the norm, no matter what you do. Uh, and with little adaptions, uh, depending on, on, on people, companies, and of course, where it is possible. I know not every job can be done virtually or fully remote or hybrid, but there are many asks of having more flexibility uh, uh, for the future, uh, as, I, as I see in all my customer conversations. Anyone else have uh, any additional thoughts to share about this? I think the other okay. thing I would add around decision making is that, um, you know, diversity of thought is important. So we talked a little bit about DEI and B already, but in terms of decision making, I think as leadership teams, as we make these decisions, it's important to embrace whatever diversity exists in your organization. So as leaders, that can really be helpful in making a decision that represents all, all the voices to the extent possible, the kinds of people who will be affected by your decisions. Um, and so I think, you know, at looking around the room and asking yourself, who's in this room, virtual, <laughs> virtual room or otherwise, you know, um, you know, is everyone represented here? And and if not, it's critical, I think, to find people who can articulate the position of those people not in the room, ask them, listen to them and and have that reflected back. Mm -hmm. That brings that goes back to the culture, right? So you need to make sure that there is a culture for virtual meetings, or not to say virtual, and the new setup of how we do meetings is established, so that really this interaction keeps keeps up between everybody, and nobody is forgotten. Even if it's a simple thing that you coach your managers to say, make sure everybody can raise or ask something, and not to be forgotten. I think that's a very valid point, Adrian. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess on that note, actually, there's one other um, thing I would mention. Uh, so ironically, I mean, I've been I've been studying how people collaborate for over 20 years. And uh, many of the things that I've accumulated over time are the ways that we struggle to actually collaborate effectively, even when we are in person. So a lot of the assumptions underlying the return to office policies uh, assume that if we bring everybody back, it's just going to be great. But it it turns out that, in, in fact, some of these folks that we're talking about from a DE and I perspective that we would like to incorporate have a very difficult time being incorporated, acknowledged, um, and, and given, um, you know, authority and uh, influence on issues that they're experts on uh, when we work together in real time, just because of our uh habits and biases as human beings. Nobody's intending to uh, leave anybody out. It's just how we tend to behave. And so sometimes some of our hybrid approaches are actually among the things that have been looked at in research even prior to the pandemic as approaches that actually improve the quality of uh, interaction. You can get more input from people in a more equitable way. You can be very um, cognizant of if you've heard from everybody or how the decision is made, how people's input is weighted, uh, et cetera, when you use some of these hybrid approaches. So I have seen it as actually an opportunity opportunity to improve the quality of collaboration and have found it interesting that some leaders anyway assume that things will just be better if we're all together again and that's not what the research has shown for decades. It's interesting to hear you say that Anita because we conducted a survey amongst our employees so 3,500 employees across all of our geographies and um and I was surprised by the results, but I guess you wouldn't have been. But I think leadership believes that the, that people enjoy the office space as a collaborative environment. And in fact, 60 percent of our workforce said that, that what they value the most about the office is a quiet place to get work done. Which kind of rocked everybody's world a little bit. So it took us some time to think, all right, so it's not maybe what we thought it was. The value is not it is not there for collaboration. And I think that's a really a direct reflection of, as you say, people's different working styles, people's level of comfort with different kinds of meetings, right? So, um, you know, outside of a handful of departments like a creative team in, in, within the marketing department, who really, uh, who really enjoy in-person brainstorming, you know, mostly people just want to be in the office for a quiet space. Yeah. 
or to have the autonomy to get together with their team when they need to collaborate. I think that's another approach that when it's possible, organizations have found has been very well received. It's a good uh, point on marketing, kind of wanting to get together to brainstorm in person. And what I've seen is that different departments, uh, hybrid means different things and they want a different uh, parts of the organization want different things out of hybrid. And some of them really value mm-hmm. that kind of coming together and it works for that team or that department. And other departments find actually you get more work done uh, or better work done working in a hybrid manner. So mm-hmm. there is not one size fits all, even for a single organization. And that makes uh, hybrid uh, a challenge and an opportunity. <laughs> Wonderful. I think yeah, that another is so dimension great. to hybrid, right? <laughs> yeah, another dimension to hybrid. <laughs> right. Um, we are we are running out of time, and um, we'll have to leave it here. So this has been mm-hmm. a fascinating, fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it, and I feel like I'm personally walking away with a lot of uh, great insights and uh, ideas. And I think the biggest takeaway for me is uh, hybrid work doesn't really just present challenges, but also opportunities. And that is opportunities to build a better culture, better uh, work uh, workplace, and also for opportunities for executives to really rethink and even reshape the path um, towards their organization's long-term sustainability and uh, prosperity. And also, uh, in the meantime, another big takeaway from me by, by me is uh, technology that provides a very powerful tool in this process. Uh, it definitely is very essential to preserve uh, uh, for preserving a workplace connection but technology alone is not sufficient it really requires recalibrating management mindset and practices and even culture change so we'll leave it uh, leave it here today uh, thank you all very much for joining me in this fascinating discussion and thank you again to google workspace for your sponsor uh, sponsorship have a good day everyone